Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focus Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, the focal and symmetric cerebellar ataxias by timeline. The focal and symmetric cerebellar ataxias by timeline. In other words, how do we approach cerebellar ataxias? There are so many cerebellar ataxias. Is there any easy and simple way to approach cerebellar ataxias? We can approach cerebellar ataxias in the best possible way if we consider two points. First, whether it is focal only on one side or symmetrical, that is bilateral. So the first consideration should be whether it is focal or bilateral. The second consideration should be the timeline, whether it is acute, that is hours to days or subacute, that is days to weeks or chronic from months to years. So two important points we need to consider. If we consider these two points, it is easy to approach a person having cerebellar ataxia. The approach to cerebellar ataxias becomes easy if we consider two points. One, whether it is focal or symmetrical. Second, whether it is acute, subacute or chronic. Now let's see, let's broadly divide cerebellar ataxias into focal, that is only on one side and symmetrical, that is present bilaterally. And then we will have subcategories, whether it is acute, subacute or chronic. Here we go. The focal and one-sided cerebellar disorders and symmetric and progressive cerebellar disorders. First, we will consider acute. The acute condition that means the cerebellar ataxia starts within hours to days. So it starts very fast, hours to days. So the important considerations in this acute focal cerebellar disorders are vascular. It could be cerebellar infarction or hemorrhage. The cerebellum is basically supplied by three blood vessels. The pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery coming off from the vertebral artery. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery coming from the basilar artery. And the superior cerebellar artery coming from the basilar artery. Here, though all these vessels affect cerebellum, there are some characteristic features. For example, if the posterior inferior cerebellar artery causes cerebellar infarction, usually the lateral part of the medulla gets affected, they present with severe vertigo. If the anterior inferior cerebellar artery gets affected, the labyrinthine artery also usually gets affected, so they'll have hearing loss. So one of these stroke syndromes which presents with, with hearing loss is anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Superior cerebellar artery will have all the cerebellar manifestations. So vascular, either cerebral, cerebellar infarction or hemorrhage. Second is infections. If the infection can be localized to one cerebellar hemisphere, only on one side of the cerebellum. If that is the case, then we'll think of cerebellar abscess, which can be picked up by CT or MRM. So the conditions which cause focal, that is only on one side, on, on the cerebellum and then acute presentation are vascular as a cerebellar infarct or hemorrhage because of pica post inferior cerebellar artery involvement or ica anterior inferior cerebellar involvement or superior cerebellar involvement second is infection cerebellar abscess which can be picked up by ct or mri right now what are the diseases which we have to consider in acute cause of symmetric and progressive cerebellar disorders here now both the cerebellum gets affected and it is acute. So what are the considerations? One intoxication, either alcohol or phenytoin. When the person takes alcohol, it affects the cerebellum. Even acute it can affect the cerebellum and can they can present with acute cerebellitis, alcoholic cerebellitis. Second is phenytoin. Neurologists give phenytoin for epilepsy. But then there could be some miscommunication or misunderstanding and instead of taking three tablets of phenytoin, they may be taking many tablets of phenytoin 
uh, which may be prescribed for some other disease, some other antibiotic or some other medications may be prescribed in a large, in, in, in many number of doses or large quantities, they may mistake it and probably they take or that is unintentionally they may take a lot of phenytoin or even uh, intentionally for for uh, 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 fatality for any suicidal reasons or anything they may take. So when there is a too much of phenytoin dose, it can affect cerebellum and can present as cerebellitis. So alcohol and phenytoin intoxication, acute intoxication affects both the cerebellum and can present as a symmetric and progressive cerebellitis. Second is acute viral cerebellitis. Viral infections can affect the both the cerebellum and can present as a symmetric and progressive in an acute manner. Second, third is a post-infectious syndrome. So the considerations for acute cerebellar involvement, which is present symmetrically and progressive are intoxications by alcohol or phenytoin, infections, viral infections or post-infectious syndrome. Right. Now let's see the another component, the subacute component where it progresses from days to weeks. So subacute presenting as a focal one-sided cerebellar lesion and subacute presenting affecting both the cerebellum presenting as a symmetric and progressive. First, let's see the subacute focal cerebellar disorders. Here we have the neoplastic cerebellar glioma or metastatic tumor can present can affect one cerebellum and can present as a focal cerebellar involvement present in a subacute state that is over days to weeks. It can be picked up by CT and MRI. Second is demyelination, multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a central demyelinating disorder affecting the myelin sheath. So all the tracts and the structures which are well myelinated gets affected. So the posterior column gets affected but the spinothalamic tract does not get affected because it is the least myelinated tract. Posterior column gets affected, pyramidal tract gets affected, optic nose gets affected, cerebellum gets affected because these are well myelinated tracts. So demyelination multiple sclerosis affects cerebellum. We can get it by history and then confirm it by CSF oligoclonal bands and by MRI by we see plaques. Right. Now, diseases presenting in a subacute manner that is from days to weeks but this time affecting both the cerebellum presenting a symmetric and progressive form. The concentrations here are intoxication, intoxication by mercury or chemotherapeutic agents and second is alcoholic nutrition that is vitamin B1, vitamin B1 and B12 deficiencies can present in a subacute manner affecting both the cerebellum. Right. Now let's see the third part, the chronic going on from months to years but lateralized to only one cerebellum that is focal. Here, the main considerations are congenital lesions and gliosis. Congenital lesions, example, Arnold Chiari malformation can affect only one cerebellum, can present from months to years because it is present in childhood, it goes on and on for years and years together. Or Dandy Walker syndrome, where the fourth ventricle fails to open. So these are congenital lesions presenting right from the childhood going on for months and years together usually localized to one cerebellum and second is the gliosis which could be a chronic gliotic scar which could be secondary to vascular or demyelinated disorder so the chronic conditions going on months to years but this time affecting both the cerebellum and presenting as a symmetric and progressive form here the considerations are one the paraneoplastic syndrome the tumor can go and spread to the cerebellum directly, what we call as a metastatic form, or it can produce some antibodies and can go and affect the cerebellum. Paraneoplastic cerebellar disorder, not a direct invasion, but producing antibodies and affecting the cerebellum, known as a paraneoplastic syndrome. Usually the lung cancer is the commonest tumor, which presents as a paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration. Second is hypothyroidism. When the thyroid hormones are less, it can affect both the cerebellum and can present in a chronic manner. The third is inherited disorders. Example, Frederick's ataxia. We see in, in children going on, it's a degenerated disease going on for years, months and years together. Peripheral tract gets affected, the cerebellum gets affected, the spinal cerebellar tract gets affected, peripheral nerve gets affected. Since it's an inherited neuropathy, 
there will be bone and bone changes. They will they have scoliosis and they can have high arch foot. We see the spine and foot deformities in a long standing chronic neuropathies because the inherited neuropathies or chronic neuropathies affect the muscles unequally. If they affect the paravertebral muscles unequally, they will have scoliosis. If they affect the foot muscles unequally, they will have high arch foot. So Frederick's ataxia is a neurodegenerative disease affecting the cerebellum bilaterally going on for months and years together. And finally, we have neurosyphilis, the tertiary form of tabes dorsalis, which can also affect cerebellum. So, though there are many causes of cerebellar ataxia, if we go systematically and having these two important points as focus and which we address it, we can easily approach a person having cerebellar ataxia and diagnose. The first and foremost is that whether it is focal, that is only on one side or bilateral, that is symmetrical. Second, the timeline, whether it is acute, subacute or chronic. So if we approach a cerebellar ataxia with these two points in mind, then we can approach a person having cerebellar ataxia confidently, diagnose and treat accordingly. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture. If you have any suggestions or comments, kindly post on to my YouTube channel. But please like and subscribe my YouTube channel. Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.